chasing it it's gone up into the building works 333 triple Nelson if you want to be superstitious about it of what a reception this man's going to get the leader of his side the Indian players applauding almost glad to be part of history those men on the balcony certainly are so is the crowd never before will Graham Gooch have left the field to this sort of reception at the time, you know, it was a, it was a, a good performance and I was uh, obviously very pleased about it. A good performance, <laughs> going 333. Um, well, we, we, it was a great match to play in and uh, obviously having a, a, a big highlight, like a score like that, most players wouldn't even get a chance um, through sheer length of time in a match to, 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 to compile a score like that, so I feel myself very fortunate. I suppose every year from now on you'll be sending a postcard of thanks to Azure Din for winning the toss and putting you in, and to the wicketkeeper Kieran Morey for dropping you when you scored about 30. Well, yes, I mean, uh, Azza won't be the, the, the last captain to, test captain to put a side in, and certainly uh, Kieran Morey uh, didn't get the Teflon round that one, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I can only be thankful for that, and uh, at the time, you know, you, you don't realise that uh, it, it, it's going to work out like that, and you just go and try and do your best every ball and carry on hour by hour. And uh, fortunately, it went on for more hours than uh, I expected at the beginning. <laughs> was getting to 300 the most important part of that innings? Yes, I mean, uh, as a player playing for 17 or 18 years, I, I said, uh, you know, I regard myself as fortunate that uh, to score that because in most players' careers, they wouldn't have enough time available um, to compile a, a, a triple, triple century because, you know, the length of the match is, is such that it, it wouldn't permit. But having reached the 290s and having played at Chelmsford once against Kent and uh, being dismissed for 275, I was quite nervous and determined once I got to 290 to, uh, to try and go on and get 300. And in those last few runs, you're pretty nervous because, you, you know, you don't want to foul up. Really. Well, it's been a great gooch. The first ball after tee bowled by Ravi Shastri. You didn't exactly seem all that chuffed when you got to 300. You still seem so low-key about it all. Well, I've never have been one, you know, for uh, jumping up and down and, and saluting the crowd from each all four corners of the ground. That's not my style. I got the sort of miserable approach to it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't say I tend to play up to that, but I, I find it difficult to sort of... Uh, uh, get out of that mode and uh, I just like concentrating. I like playing. Inwardly I was very pleased and I, I get quite excited, you know, inwardly, but I've never been a good one for showing my emotions. Do you wish now, looking back on it, that you'd got the extra 33 runs that would have given you the highest test match score? Well, I mean, uh, at the time I was a little bit disappointed getting out, although 333 is a, a nice number to be out on, um, because, you know, you get so close and you think you you could be capable of achieving the highest score, and it was certainly within in the grasp. But um, you know, looking back on it, you know, it's an understatement to say you'd be happy for that, happy with that when you went out there to bat. But uh, yes, I suppose I'm disappointed a little bit that I didn't manage to go on a bit further. But uh, when all said and done, uh, um, it, it was a great match to play, and I was just uh, happy to be part of it. Ninety-eight for Gooch. Highest test score for Graham Gooch, beating his previous best of 196 against Australia. A 
ball is going to race away from uh, Sidhu. He'll just get it inside the ropes. And Gooch will go on to a double century. First ball after tee, bowled by Ravi Shastri. 66 to go. Ravi Shastri is the bowler. Four more to Gooch. Don't bother looking for that, let alone chasing it. It's gone up into the building works. Is it or isn't it? It is. That is four. Wasn't the most athletic piece of fielding. The ball was hit hard. Bowled him. Probably gone inside edge. Success finally. Gooch goes. 333. Triple Nelson, if you want to be superstitious about it. Of what a reception this man's going to get. Quiver of emotion from you when you walk back and the whole crowd rose to you. That must be a great moment. Um, yes, it's uh, lovely when there's a big crowd there, especially when you do well at Lords. Um, fortunately for me, Lords has been a very happy hunting ground all through my career. I remember is when he turned up we used to have our pre-season nets at to the old Ilford cricket school and I can remember him turning up there as a very very young lad a lad about 12 years old you know, I've seen him really I've seen him grow up from that sort of age when Alf his father used to bring him along he's been around my cricket my type of cricket since he was in the carrier cot but having said that as he grew up through the years uh, uh, there was occasions, say when he was about nine, when we, as usual with our type of team, uh, we turned up with a couple short, he'd be dragged on to field the ball because he could run more than us older, old codgers, you know. He was offered a place on the Athletic staff um, a year before he actually took it. He turned that down to complete his apprenticeship as a toolmaker in case he didn't make it in cricket. Um, that was a waste, wasn't it? He always had time, and I suppose that is always a, a sign of, of players who have got real talent and ability. Yes, I always thought he would he'd be a top cricketer, but the one thing which helped him become a top cricketer is that he was always prepared to work, and he's always worked. You know, sometimes I think he works too hard at it, but he always works at his game. Roger Knight, bowling to Gooch. That's the single letter, Graham Gooch, and another little landmark for this top-class player. That is the highest score ever made in a Benson and Hedges final. A massive hit. It's the short side of the ground, but it's still a tremendous blow from this strong man of the Essex and England side, Graham Gooch, and he goes into the 90s. this time 10 from two balls so 
So it's 226 for two with uh, Gooch on 96, Fletcher on 23, and this is Robin Jackman. Fletcher Batsman, and four more, an improvised stroke, and a very good one, and absolute mayhem here today in the cricketing terms. With Surrey putting Essex into bat, and strokes flowing over after over. Great shot. That's the former England test player at his best, Keith Fletcher. How important was that first trophy, the Benson Hedges final? Well, in, in purely in Essex terms, it was monumental because uh, we'd gone 100 and few years, 103 or was it 108? I'm not quite sure. Should know, shouldn't I? Anyway, it was over 100 years, a long time. But Essex is one of the only two counties, I believe, that had never won the championship um, or never won a trophy. So um, to reach the final uh, was a magnificent achievement. Um, we'd come second in the championship the year before in 78. Now to reach the Benson Hedges final and the chance of their first trophy was, a, was tremendous for all the players. Keith Fletcher had players that had been there for 10 years previously. Uh, players like John Lever, David Ackfield, Ray East, uh, Stuart Turner. All these players have been with the county for a long time. And to play in a tremendous match at Lords against Surrey, where we scored 290 and they scored 270, and to carry off our first tro trophy was a, a breaking of ice, really, in Essex terms, and one that will always stick in my mind because of the, the pure fact that uh, it was the first trophy we ever won. It will always be very special to me and all the players who played in that match. It's, it's the day that any Essex player who played in that game will never, ever forget because I suppose there was 20-odd thousand there and there was 20-odd thousand Essex supporters. I think Surrey had about two. But... Uh, Obviously, him scoring that 100, it was a brilliant 100, and it, in, along with other things, it was part of the reason we won the, ga we won the game in the end. It's been a pretty unhappy day for Robin Jackman. Nowhere near 100% uh, fit, but uh, trying to bolster the Surrey attack. He's in his 10th over now, and uh, the previous nine have been very expensive ones. In that a gooch. And uh, coming through on the misfield, and a tremendous roar hits Lords as Graham Gooch goes through to three figures. Superb hundred this by the England batsman. Glorious century made out of a total of 242 for three. And coming up in just the 49th over. Shade over three hours for his hundred. Only received 130 balls, two big sixes and ten fours. And the first hundred ever scored in a Benson Hedges final. I noticed you rather modestly neglected at the time with it. You scored 100 in that game, Graham. Yeah, well, in, in the course of the match, I managed to score 120 at the same time, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, just passed, that just passed during the course of the match. I mean, uh, the innings went very well for me. I'll never forget the fact that when myself and Mike Dennis walked down those steps at Lords and being Essex's first final, you know, it was absolutely chock-a-block with Essex supporters in there. There was such a roar that day, it was unreal, and uh, from ball one, things tended to go our way, and Surrey didn't quite get it together, and managed to run up the huge total of 290, although they batted tremendously well also, and run us right to the last few overs. 120 now, Wilson the bowler. And it's all over for him, left it wide open, looking to crack Wilson through the offside, and the end of a memorable performance is from Graham Gooch. He's taken the Surrey attack to pieces. He's given great delight to this immense crowd, and he's finally bowled by Wilson for a magnificent 120, made out of a total of 273 for five. And a pack lords now rising to give a tremendous ovation to Graham Gooch. This is your team, isn't it? East Ham Corinthians? Yes. That's you there. That's me. Now, I reckon that's Graham. That is true. Yeah. How old was he then? Ooh, 11, 12. Yeah, looking very thoughtful. In fact, Graham's beginning to look like you, Al. Good looking. <laughs> right, that's East Ham Corinthians. Now, here we are. He's graduating to higher things. 1969, he'd be 16. 
going to East Africa with London schools. Now that's Graham there, isn't it? Yes, the one with the haircut. It's a cracking haircut, isn't it? Pudding basin job, is it? Not, uh, not quite. He went out and had that done himself. And that's his great mate, John Embry. That's John Embry and... John Embry and Graham have been mates, mates. ever since, haven't they? That's true, that's true. Great experience at yes. 16. And now here we are the following year at Edgbaston, playing for the south of England against the north. There, well, he's beginning to look like the Gooch uh, of a few years on there. Now here we are, Essex Schools. Here's Graham again in the front row. Now, he, um, he kept wicket in those days, didn't he? Uh, Graham came up to me and said, Dad, They've asked me to play wicket with Keeper. I said, well, how do you feel about it? And he said, well, I want to play in the team, so if that's the way into the team, then I'll play. And he'd be how old then, Essex schools against Hampshire schools? About 12. About 12. 13. Looks like butter wouldn't melt in his mouth there, Alf, doesn't yes. it? Yes. And here he is going to East Africa that summer. Yes, that was at... Uh in London, where they congregated before going to the airport. Typical Gooch pose, that, isn't it, Alf? Yes. He says his aim was to play for Essex. And here's his debut for Essex. Second team, July 69. That would be just ahead of his 16th birthday. That's right. <clears throat> now, I understand he arrived in the Rolls-Royce at Northampton with the captain. Yes. I always remember Graham telling me that he was a bit peeved about batting number 11 and didn't get a bet in this particular match. Mm -hmm. But he was quite chuffed about uh, travelling to the match in a Rolls Royce. Now here's an interesting one, Alf. This is Graham's first century in any competition? In any organised cricket, yes. And he was 17 before he got his first 100 in any organised cricket. He really put bat to ball there on that particular day. And that's when you were beginning to think that you might have something you to might offer. have something, yeah. 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 They're great, these scrapbooks, aren't they? In there. Yeah. He looked fairly dour in those days, didn't he? Yes, he didn't smile a lot. He still does now. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they, the press people get me in the wrong mood. I don't know. But um, I don't think I'm too miserable a person most of the time. It's just that um, I've, I've sort of acquired this image. And once, it, once you get an image, a stamp, it seems to stick with you. And uh, I seem to ride along with it. I think it's the poker face, perhaps, and the fearsome moustache. Um, yeah, the moustache has come and gone, and the, the stubble beard and the, the unshaven look's been and, been and gone, and they might come back again. We don't know at the moment. We're looking rather, but actually, we're looking rather 12 years ago at the moment with the, the moustache is a bit, bit longer. There's a bit more, there's a part of what I got the nickname for, actually. Um, I don't know. You didn't have uh, the moustache. Uh, you had a lot of long hair nearly 20 years ago when you pitched up at this, mm. uh, this ground. That must seem an eternity ago to you, but. From what I understand of you, you always had this inner desire to succeed. I always wanted to make it to the top level, and, and as soon as you mentioned this ground, I mean, we're sitting here now in the pavilion. When I first came to this ground, um, back in 19... I couldn't remember exactly, about 68, I remember scoring for Essex second level as a young lad, just in one game, and this ground was just a green field. It was an old green hut, wooden hut, which was the pavilion, and the rest of the ground was just a green field and there was nothing else here at all. And it was a lovely wicket then, and uh, I, th I tend to think the ground's improved, obviously. It's a nice little ground to play on, and uh, I'm just so happy that uh, I've been able to play here over the last 20 years. You are an Essex man through and through, aren't you? I get the impression that the success that Essex has had in your time is as important to you as your England success. My first love really is Essex, although People might not, I don't want to get the wrong impression that I don't care about playing for England because I do immensely and uh, I take great, great pride of captain England and, and being with the England players and going out there and doing your best for the country. But Essex has always been very good to me. I've always had a tremendous support here. I've had a lot of success here and I've really enjoyed playing with the likes of Keith Fletcher, John Lever, Brian Hardy over many, many years and uh, Essex means a lot to me and I... I always given my best for them and always will continue to do so and uh, we've had a special sort of family atmosphere at Essex here in the last uh, 15 years or so. As Essex were beginning to develop under Keith Fletcher's captaincy in the mid-70s uh, you then played for England at the age of just 22 and uh, I think it's safe to say that you could only improve after your first test match Graham. Well yes you see, well, I do well, 
occasional after dinner speech and I always mention that my first test match, one of my first captains was Mike Deness and uh, I didn't see too much of Mike because I didn't spend too, like, too, too long on the field to be honest but uh, I remember a few things about that first test match back in 1975. I remember turning up there and, you know, because most of the players in that match were experienced test players. There wasn't hardly anyone who'd played one or two matches. Most of them had played quite a few or been involved in the scene for a while. So I felt very much the new boy. I, to be fair, I'd only just come into playing county cricket 18 months beforehand. So it was a very new experience to me. Um, I remember fielding a fine leg once and I, I was dreading the ball coming to me and if I got to the ball I'd get it in as quickly as possible because I didn't want to make any mistakes and uh, I don't actually remember too much about the batting but it was over in a flash anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he took it fairly well obviously it's not the, it goes without saying, it's not the ideal start but he was unlucky, he got a good delivery, I know he got a good delivery second dig, I can't remember him first dig, I don't know whether he got caught down the leg side which is one of those sort of, dis one of, those sort of ways of getting out which is the worst way of getting out of all apart from being run out. But uh, he took it fairly well. You know, he was a sort of he was a sort of lad who was able to bounce back from that sort of start. I wonder if he was picked too soon for England. Yeah, I, I personally I don't think there's a lot of talk said about starting too soon. I don't think you can start too soon. Uh, I personally think if, if a player's good enough to play one day then he's good enough a week later. You know, that is my opinion of players whether you know, what I'm saying, I think it was wrong that he was left out for so long. You, know, you don't suddenly become a bad player. But uh, it was, I don't think you can start too young. I actually played in the second test match at Laws under Tony Gregg, but uh, after the first match, there was a, a week or so in between, or two weeks it might have been, I, I really started to lose a bit of form then. I played well that season, early season. But my form started to go a bit and I scratched around in the second test match for six in the first innings, I think, and 31 in the second and wasn't uh, at my best. So it was quite right and proper that they, they didn't continue with me and they, they looked for someone else. And it took me until 1978 to get back into the side. And also I did play uh, three one-day internationals the following year against West Indies, but really didn't establish sort of my best form. and. Uh, um, it took me a, a long time to get back into the side and of course the major difference then was I was then opening the batting in 1978. Graham came into Test Match Cricket the second time, the first time he played and got a pair and uh, he was in a bit of trouble early on. But when he came in the second time, um, I was towards uh, the end of my career for England, coming towards it in the last few years and Graham was starting. So it is a good situation of an experienced player and a younger player and we actually got on very well. We, we different types of characters, as I said, in our batting, but actually different types of people. But yet we have a good sense of humour together, we can always chat together. I think that's very good for opening batsmen, to have an understanding. I don't think you want to feel that you're competing against each other. You have enough on competing against the bowlers, as it were, of the opposition. And uh, I always had that good rapport with him. We could laugh in the middle of crises and tensions in the middle of the wiki, and yet get down to business, as it were. So I enjoyed playing with him. He, he started off, actually, um, a sort of new boy, inexperienced, grew quite quickly into the job of opening the innings. It didn't take him long. Fairly quick that to the ring of close fielders. That'll go through 4 4 and bring up the 54 England. Sikanda bowling from the nursery end now. Gooch is the batsman. And that's the half century stand up there between Gooch and Gower. Sikanda. Four runs. Fine shot from Gooch. A little bit of cramp for room there, but. Uh, Still got that away with plenty of power through the gully area. Oh, that's a good shot by Gooch this time off the back foot, packed away through the offside for four, leaves the way up and then for Graham Gooch to handle his return back to Test Match Cricket, also with a 50. He's on 49, facing the slow left arm spin of Kazim. And shrewdly and deftly just pushed it away quietly on the offside for a single. And how well Graham Gooch has played here today. Right from the very first ball, he struck the ball in the middle of the bat. He's progressed soundly and extremely sensibly to an excellent 50. Just over a couple of hours, five minutes over two hours for his 50. He's hit uh, four fours, 
And oddly enough, he's received fewer balls, in fact, than David Gow. What attracted you to be the opener rather than the middle-order batsman? Well, it, it was Keith Fletcher, really. In 1977, I had a, a poorish season, scratched around for a bit less than 1,000 runs, I think, and, and I was back in number five. And we had Brian Hardy, our Scottish uh, uh, colleague. He was opening the batting in then days, and, and he had a poor season as well in 1977. And Fletcher said to us that, you know, you're batting at number... Um, Number five, you got Mike Dennis. Uh, he arrived in 1977 to play for our club, opening the batting. Kenny McEwen himself, and I wasn't getting in um, till a bit later in the innings because you know there were three very good players, and Brian was struggling a bit. So he decided to um, have a swap round. He asked me how I fancied opening the batting, and I said, "Well, I'm prepared to give it a try." And Brian went down to five, and it worked tremendously successfully. We came second in the championship. I managed to regain a place in the England side. But I think, Pat, what it, it did to me as a player, it made me realise the importance of concentration. Because up until then, I mean, I had, I had ability battling in the middle order um, and I could score good runs. But, you know, I was always prone to getting myself out and making mistakes and playing a loose shot. And I think the advent of me opening the batting made me tighten up my game helped my concentration, that part of my game, tremendously and, and really started me on the, on the road to um, developing the type of player that uh, everyone's seen over the last, how long is it? Long while, 13 years. The amount of work you put in after coming onto the staff and then playing for England and coming back and deciding that he was going to make himself into an opening batsman, not an easy thing to do, especially for somebody who played the game the way he did. He was always looking to hit the ball, um, something that quite a few opening bats uh, wouldn't dream of doing. I won't mention any names there. But it, very hard work for him, and I thought he applied himself as he did with his bowling as well. About that time, I started to put some um, honest and endeavouring work into, into, into fitness as well, because you know I was about middle 20s then, um, I'd got through all right up until then. I wasn't, wasn't a very a great fielder, but I was adequate. And I thought, oh, I could improve that. And certainly, if I was fitter and stronger, um, it was going to uh, help my game. I mean, if he didn't do running and the exercise he does, he'd absolutely blow up because he enjoys his food. And I think, I think to enjoy his food, he has to do lots of exercise. Um, but he enjoys his exercise. He does lots of running. He runs lots of half marathons. Um, something that I couldn't do. I mean, I blow up a different way. I fall on the floor if I run 100 yards. But um, no, he enjoys his running, and I think the great thing about it is that, and, and another reason why the players respect him, is that when he does do that, at least he does it. He doesn't say, right, we're going to do this, do that, and he doesn't do it. You know, he leads from the front. It's not his fault about his legs, uh, but his, the rest of it is pretty good. What do you call him? Chicken legs? Chicken legs, yeah. Well, I mean, how can you have a body that's sort of King Kong's top half and, you know, uh, Bruce Reed's bottom half? Well, it doesn't really work. He does so much training, though, to get those legs thicker, well, and it doesn't work, does it? Well, maybe he's doing too much. You and he are poles apart in terms of uh, attitude to physical fitness and dedication for the fray. Well, there's a difference between training and dedication. Dedication to the game is one thing, which I think uh, my dedication to the game has been proved throughout. Uh, dedication to training, well, um, I'm a great believer in the, ba the way that bowlers and get fit to bowling. Shame about Graham's addiction to West Ham United, though, isn't it? It's a big, well, it's a I mean, it's stain. like his legs, you can't do a lot about it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have a professional at the top for England to, to show that responsibility and that professionalism to youngsters coming into the side because uh, the England team, at times, uh, has been criticised by because some of the players have used it a little bit of a playboy situation, just enjoyed it, rather than enjoyed it and being professional. From the time that he leaves home in the morning um, to start his day's work as a professional cricketer, um, he's thinking then, he gets out of his car here at Chelmsford, and the way he conducts himself in the dressing room right the way through the day, whether he's a player in the side or whether he's leading that side as captain, um, he's a model. But Safori was looking for. So another nice crack off the back foot by Graham Gooch, takes him through to 50. An excellent 50. Um, having played in 78 against uh, Pakistan and New Zealand and, and done reasonably well, my wife Brenda's auntie Grace um, gave me some VHS videotapes 
of some of the highlights. And I was I was watching these and I was crouching a lot when I was batting and moving across the stumps and my head wasn't in a good position. And I thought, well, I've got to do something about this because I'm obviously playing across the line a lot and not looking comfortable at all. And the reason that the stance came about was simply because I, I couldn't get my head um, up straight and get my eyes level and be comfortable by still uh, standing in, in, in the conventional stance. So I had to lift the bat off the ground and raise the bat a la Tony, Greg, Clive Rice, one or two other players. And that became comfortable for me. And um, it's interesting now, actually, if I look back at those tapes from 1979, when I first started that, 1980, you'll see my stance is not the same as it is now. But that was the thing that really started me off um, to having the success that, that, that has gone my way over the years. Very, very strong. Yes, they then based him over this situation, all the experts like Mr. Swanton, Tony Lewis, people of that uh, uh, ilk. And uh, my answer to them is just look in the scorebooks. Well, Graham, with the experimental backlift, which stayed with you all these years, you were then entrenched in the England side, still learning your trade, obviously, at the highest level. 99 against the Australians in 79, 80 on that tour. But then the great moment for you, I suspect, the 100 at Lords against the West Indies, not just because of the quality of the opposition, but the way you play? Um, yes, I mean, I, I think uh, just briefly touching on when I got run out for 99, in, in 79, 80 against Australia, I played pretty well in the three test matches, but now I hadn't reached 100. And, you know, we're now getting to the stage where I'd played some. 15 or so test matches, I'm not sure whether that's quite right, but round about that, and I hadn't scored 100, so um, it was becoming difficult, and uh, Lords against the West Indies in 1980, everything went right for me, and uh, since that first uh, series against them then, West Indies has always been a sort of lucky side for me, and one that um, I've managed to do well against. So Graham Gooch into the 90s now, is this going to be his first test match 100? Well, that's another four. <laughs> no nervous 90s at the moment. Crushes it through the offside. Three boundaries in this over. Two threats to cover and one straight. 1980. Holding Roberts, Garner Croft. The most fearsome fast bowling attack the world has known. And it was fearsome. Believe me. And, uh, I mean, sometimes you'd be batting when Holding and Roberts were, were getting stuck into you with the new ball. And we'd have a little chat in the middle of the wicket. And uh, uh, we say, well... We, we got through the uh, the difficult ones, fiery. The easy ones are coming next. Garner and Croft, which was a, a sense of humour, you know, that it wasn't going to be easy. There was no easy overs against them. And I remember at Lords in 1980 when they were all four bowling, and he got himself run out in Australia a couple of months before for 99, and which was very sad. He hadn't really made a Test hundred, you see. And in this Test match, his second Test at Lords, he pulled out all the stops on a pretty good pitch. But we weren't in too good a position. I think we only made about 250 all that. And I watched him because I got out early on, actually. I watched him from the dressing room. He played well, but there was a moment in that match at Lord, full house, when he had them. He had them by the scruff of the neck. Chat to himself there to concentrate. Nebel call. And the 100 for Graham Gooch. And it could hardly happen to a nicer fellow. Really top class performance. He's in for only 188 minutes for that century. 145 balls he faced, 6 and 13 fours. His first test match century and Although he's not given to a great deal of uh, smiling on the field, inwardly he will be thrilled, completely delighted. When he reached his hundred, I was so full of emotion that I had to get up and rush out and go downstairs to the toilet beneath the queue stand. I was, it really welled up within me and uh, I just couldn't do nothing about it. I just had to get out of the way. 
It but wasn't... when he made his 333, he seemed to pass over my head, you know. Well, you're still wearing the tie, Al. This is yeah. the 333 tie, isn't it? That's true. That's the true. That's... Three, and three, three. Uh, they are on sale now. Yeah. Not a... <laughs> Like father likes, like father like son, <laughs> never misses the chance. That's a lovely shot over pitch, driven firmly and fiercely through the covers for four. And Gooch very quick to seize the opportunity of the over pitch ball. And then a few months later, you got another hundred against the West Indies at Barbados early in 1981. And the context of that was important for you because your great mentor, Kenny Barrington, who was England manager at the time, had collapsed and died during that test match. Yes, uh, Kenny had been sort of uh, helping the players on tours and at home matches. He was selector in those days as well, ever since I came back into the England side in 1978. And he was very much a father figure to the um, younger players and all the players on the tour. And he was very well liked by the whole touring party. He was very popular because he used to go out of his way to help the players uh, technically and with their game. He was always fun and a good guy to be with off the field and was always very friendly and amenable to the players' wives and girlfriends as well. So he was very popular and it was a great, great shock when he collapsed and died in the uh, hotel in Barbados. I mean, I remember now to this day Alan Smith and Ian Botham knocking on the hotel room door. My, myself and my wife Brenda were there. and. It, when we opened the door at 8 o'clock in the morning, it was obvious that something was wrong. We didn't have any idea what it was, but there was no reason they were going to be there like that uh, if there wasn't something wrong, and it was a tremendous shock. Is that one of the worst moments of your career, Graham? Yes, I think we, we, we both cried instantly, and everyone I remember at the meeting we had, you know, there was tears in their eyes, and uh, you know, the game had to go on, obviously, and we had a minute's silence during the match. and. Uh, Yes, it was, it was one of the saddest times in my career when a, a great bloke and a great servant to English cricket in general passed away from us. So that hundred, in a sense, was to the memory of Kenny, was it? Well, yes, you, you could, you could, I can dedicate it to that. I mean, it's certainly what happened there spurred me on to uh, be doubly determined to do well in that match. And uh, it was nice for me that uh, um, it went well that day when, uh, you know, with the events of that match, uh, it was it was nice to to finish the match like that. Although we lost the match, I still gave it my all, and uh, I'll always remember Kenny as someone who was very kind and considerate and helped me a lot in my cricket. That's Peter Willie. It's a lovely shot by Graham Gooch, gave himself room, found the gap on the offside, and crushed it through there for four. So the 50 comes up for a six. And a firm positive shot from uh, Graham Gooch. More power in that. That will certainly go through for four. Safra's no chance at all of stopping it. And he's finally made it. Crashed again to the offside with two runs in this. And Graham Gooch goes through to yet another very attractive uh, 50. 51, in fact. So things are going very well on both the county front and the England front for you by the time of the early 80s. But then you took the decision to go to South Africa and you then incurred a three-year ban. Did that stem from a sudden disenchantment with test cricket, a need for financial security? Well, a bit of both, really. I mean, we, we went to India and Sri Lanka uh, on Keith Fletcher's only tour as captain of England in 1991-82 and we had a very depressing tour there. Um, we lost the first test match in Bombay and the following five test matches were all very tedious draws uh, documented by very slow play on the Indians part and we just didn't seem to get anywhere. Um, he actually captained the, the first test match against Sri Lanka, Fletch did, uh, out there, the first ever test match Sri Lanka played, and we won that one. But in the meantime, uh, we'd had an offer, some players had had an offer to play cricket in South Africa. I mean, these things I'm going to say now have been said many, many times before, but in the month of March, all the players who'd been offered were not contracted to, to, to the TCCB or to their county, and they took up the offer of playing in South Africa. You've got to bear in mind at that time there was many, many players coaching and playing in South Africa 
as a matter of course throughout the winter. But this was the first time there was an organised side of international calibre players. I would always maintain, and those players would always maintain, that it was a privately organised tour, which it was, but of course we played against a South African side, so they were deemed to be international calibre matches, and we received a three-year ban for it. Now, um, I believe I was only carrying out my right as a professional cricketer to earn my living. Um, other people will say that uh, you are supporting the South African regime. Well, I, I'd have to disagree with that. There was a bit of financial security, obviously. The money did come into it for a lot of the players. And we believed that we weren't doing anything which was against the rules, which we weren't. Um, we all accepted our ban. Um, no one liked it, obviously. No one wanted to be banned from three years from playing for their country. But uh, I suppose as a spin-off from that, as it turned out, I played two winters in South Africa for Western Province and it also coincided, although not coincidentally, with uh, the fact that Essex became quite successful in the years 83-84. Essex won the championship twice during that period because we also had John Lever who went to South Africa and he also played and he was a very prolific uh, performer for Essex and I don't regret it at all and um, you know when my cricket career finishes in, in years years ahead hopefully I'll look back on my whole, whole career and uh, be quite satisfied with it. Hadley again to Gooch. And he's finally got him away through that uh, short boundary. Mid wicket for four. And he's got no chance of stopping that one. So Gooch has broken free momentarily perhaps. Stroke of authority is still to be on the pick. And that's a big hit straight. A marvellous strike, this. Beautiful follow through. Clive Rice doing the rounds. We've seen uh, five quicker bowlers now, and it's the turn of Eddie Hammond, the off spinner. So the hundred comes up. So they've accelerated through the second 50. First 50 coming off 107 balls. And 68 balls, that's all the uh, second 50 a sec. goes down the wicket, just pushes it clear of the bowler. Goes on to what looked a fairly inevitable 50 after he overcame those first few overs. A big six, lovely straight six in fact from Gooch and three fours in yet another 50. Sachs will be back in the attack in place of pick. And another super shot. back after the three-year ban. You scored a lot of runs that summer against the Australians. I remember particularly you, you got a 190 yard at the Oval runs, against but, uh, them. If you can say that you're disappointed in missing out on the double 100, it must have been that day because it was there for the taking, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, um, myself and David Gower had a great day on the first day. Um, it was nice to be back. It was nice to be back international, uh, in an international cricket, especially to help England uh, defeat the Australians and uh, to take the Ashes away. That's four runs. <laughs> Wide half volley. Had to go a fair way to reach it. In fact, just about finished up hitting it with a, with a flat bat. <laughs> well, that's uh, repeated. Looked a better stroke this time. Now that's the third four already off Lawson, all taken off him by Gooch. Attacking field now. Richard Hadley from the pavilion end. That's in the air. And bounces. That was well bowled by Hadley. Gooch played that hook shot not under control, it was a short arm. Hook shot and uh, a top edge went straight up. Oh. 
Well, what else can Richard Hadley do? That's beautiful bowling. Fast leg break. No way that Graham Goodge could have touched that, but always the hope of a snick for the New Zealand slips there. Four runs to Gooch, and the 200 comes up for England. That's perfectly controlled and beautifully played by Graham Gooch. And this time, it's the batsman who's on top. A bowling change at the nursery end. Willie Watson making way for the left arm spin of Evan Gray. Other than the glorious strokes like that from Graham Gooch, who's moved along now to 128. Well, beautiful balance there from Graham Gooch. He's stayed right on balance, swung the bat, and crashed it through. Good shot for four. You were successful in 1986, Graham, when you were Essex captain for the first full season. You won the county championship, admittedly with Keith Fletcher there helping you. But the following year, you resigned the captaincy uh, amid suggestions that the whole thing had got too much for you. Now, what happened there? You know, I, I gave the captaincy up in good faith in 1987 because, at the end of 87, because I felt I wanted to put my own game in order and the only way to do that was to be able to concentrate fully on the game. I've always enjoyed captaining and, as I said, the tactics of the game and, and running the game, but I always ha I have to be playing to my ability as well, otherwise I feel that I'm not contributing what I can. Are you surprised you enjoy the England captaincy as much as you did that first test when you captained against West Indies? Yes, yeah, so well, we had a lot of problems in 88 uh, finding a regular leader. Obviously, uh, Mike Gatton unfortunately lost the job and then John Embry was made England captain and he also lost the job because um, they didn't think he was going to play in one of the matches. And then Chris Cowdery, unfortunately, again for one match. I never coveted the job as such. Um, it would have been nice to captain England, but uh, I had a change of heart and a change of view, obviously, once I was asked to do it in the last match as a stand-in. And once having got good response from the players in that match, our, I thought our performance in the last match at the Oval was improved on the early part of that summer. And um, I decided that, you know, I'd like to maybe continue if, if they wanted me to, of which they eventually did. I, I, I think he suited the job. I think, I think he's a very good captain, he's a good bloke, and he has the main thing, the main ingredient, is he re he's got the respect of the players. I think it takes time to become a captain. You know, I did it obviously for about 11, 12 years, but for the first two or three years it took me time to get into the job. I didn't enjoy it for the first two years, after that it became easy. And I think Graham now is finding it easy, it comes natural to him. He's become more and more confident. Um, let's face it, for his first uh, trip abroad um, to West Indies in leading the full England side isn't one that everybody would choose. And the, the great thing is that he could always lead by example, not the way he conducts himself, as already said, but the results he produces, first of all with the bat, um, in the field, where he never stops working at it, and, um, and always comes on um, when we can twist his arm to be a change bowler. He's got it through, he's timed it well. That'll go all the way to the boundary for four. That's a very good shot by Graham Gooch. Slightly wide of the off stump, shortish ball. He just leans into it, opens the face slightly, and guides it past backward cover. We went out there with a great team spirit. We worked very hard at our game. We caught them cold because I'm not sure they were expecting us to be um, quite so much of a threat. Maybe they think we were, they were just going to run over us. I don't know. You'd have to ask some of them that. But the, all the work we put in, the plan we had, the way we carried it out, was proven to be correct. Whacked it straight over the top. Thank you very much. It's running slowly across that very wet patch. It limps over the boundary, but that's good enough. Four runs. England need one to win.
No, wait, no, he says. Yes, he's misfielded. I think it's a one. Fantastic. And you almost went 2 0 up at Trinidad. You had the broken hand. Obviously, that was significant, Graham. Yes, we, we had a bit of fortune at Trinidad in as much that I uh, managed to win the toss, which was uh, a significant factor in this match. Um, the heat was a little bit damp on the first day. We managed to bowl West Indies out for 200. Um, they were actually 90 of for eight, I believe, but they, they got out of jail a bit, and Gus Logie played particularly well, got them to 200. But nevertheless, we would have uh, we'd have settled for 200, having put them in. We batted rather slowly, self-included, although I was the main culprit, um, on the next two days, and managed to run up a lead anyway. And then the wicket, um, after having its best period in the middle of the match, started to go very uneven on the last day especially and or, or the, the end of the fourth day and the last day and we bowled the West Indies out on the fourth day and left us 150 to, to score which on that wicket you could lose because it was a if everything went the, on the bowling side uh, everything went the bowling side's way you could lose the match but um, we got a good start 70 for one we were um, when I got my broken hand and the rain came and I, I never forget never forget this I walked over to the clinic at uh, Port of Spain and the clinic, I was having my x-ray on my hand, and I thought I never had a hip like this and never had a feeling like this. I never had a broken bone before batting. And as I walked over to the clinic, um, I went in the porch, and had like a glass, like conservatory-type porch, and this rain started to come down, and uh, I said to the guy, Jesus, it's raining. He said, don't worry, man. He said, it's only a shower. He said, you'll be all right today. <laughs> anyway, it rained for three hours. It didn't look like it was going to stop raining. And we got out there when it was really wet and, uh, well, the rest is history. They slowed it right down and we were playing in the dark and people said you should have carried on. Wanted 30 runs, five wickets down. I was going to go in next, broken hand and all, but, I mean, I would have been able to hold up an end maybe, but not score any runs. And the fact of the matter is, you know, it's going to take them 20 minutes to bowl three overs. It would have been a minute to midnight then. And it just wasn't worth it. But uh, I honestly feel um, that if we would have won that match, that they wouldn't, have been, they wouldn't have come back so well. Because I think getting out of that match uh, with a draw gave the West Indies a tremendous confidence booster to come back hard at us in the last two matches. And it must have helped your confidence as England captain too, Graham, because you came back garlanded with praise and honours from all sides. Did that not help your morale at the start of the 1990 season that you'd had such a personally successful time as captain? Yes, I think... I, th I think what uh, gave me great, great comfort was is we proved, Pat, that we could compete with the best. We proved that if we played well and played, played to our potential, that we could compete with the West Indies. So you don't have to be as good a side as anyone has experienced, but if you play to your potential, and we knew that we had to play at our best, really, to, to beat the West Indies, and we did that in the first match and in the second match. And it just proves that we, you know, as players and as cricketers in our system in England, that we can play. Beautifully played, a natural stroke, no slog at all, six runs. Edge Wilson against New Zealand, uh, 100 against them, you got the 3-3-3 three, three, three at Lords, you got 100 at Old Trafford against the Indians. We thought yeah. we'd never end. Oh, well, you know, you have one season like that in the career. You've got to qualify it a little bit by saying that 1990, uh, there was more triple centuries, more double centuries, and more centuries scored in county cricket than has ever been in the history of game. So that might give you an insight into the type of pitches we were playing on. And there goes the ball. I would describe them as batsman-friendly pitches, um, and certainly not bowler-friendly. So you've still got a squad of runs, haven't you? That was a nothing more than a little short arm jab. As the bowler looked up, he may even have thought he was in with a chance. But uh, all he's managed to do is uh, bring up the half century. I'd say now that I'm a 
steadier, more consistent player and not so much of a destroyer of bowling maybe I used to be in my earlier career, but I tend now to go on for longer and make it count. So I, I believe I'm a, I'm a better all-round player now than I was. It's more be. boring there. Yeah, I, I take less chances, play a bit more percentage, but still manage to score the runs at the, at the effective rate, and that's the most important thing. That's straight about. Another splendid innings for him. Followed his triple hundred, and his single hundred, with another hundred here at Old Trafford. What a marvellous summer. 101 for the 144 balls. I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to outplay some other guys. A young guy, I make no bones about that. That's one of the things that drives me on, is the fact is that if anyone's going to take my place, they're going to have to be playing bloody well. He's coming into Gooch, and two runs are on the board. There we go. That's an historic boundary for Graham Gooch. First round of the inning, it takes him to six. The crowd are aware of what that means. And there it is. He's now scored most runs in an English summer. It's not a record as such because these are two series, two three-match series against two different attacks, but even so, a phenomenal season for Graham Gooch. I still feel that I can play with the best and uh, we've got some exciting young players coming through at Essex and at England level and um, I'm just going to try and make it as difficult as, as I can um, for them to take my place. Again, the long half volley, pushing off the back foot. Not very intended, but no one will know about it in years to come. It will go down as a hundred. And that's a hundred. If you ask me how many this and that, I couldn't tell you. But um, um, I'd like to score 100 hundreds, yeah, I don't mind admitting that. That means you're doing well getting that out of me because I'm not one to say those sort of things. Oh, well, that's a big hit straight. He's at the very top and he'll stay at the very top as long as the record of cricket um, are kept. He's good at the moment for English cricket. English cricket needs him. Oh, he's a top class player. Uh, he's got better, actually. Oh, he's become a very, very confident player and a very good one. Don't bother looking for that, let alone chasing it. It's gone. He will always want to lead um, from the front. Um, as he has done so magnificently, and um, he would, I don't think he wouldn't be looked at in any other way. Ninety-eight for Gooch. Three hundred for Graham Gooch. First ball out to tee, bowled by Ravi Shastri. I like working with the guys. I'm only grateful I'm still playing um, this, this great game at my age, and I want to go on for, for longer because I enjoy it. I still think I can do, do, a, do a job for, for England and for Essex, and uh, I just hope that, uh, that, the, uh, that that will happen over the next few years. I don't know.